All right. Good afternoon, guys. I'm going to give everybody else just a few minutes to hop in here before we go ahead and get started. All right, so it is 12.03, so I guess we can go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Ethan Price. Uh, I've been working for Decisions for just under two years, um, part of the technical support team, uh, and I'll be hosting today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, just a few things uh, just to kind of kick off before we really get started here. Um, one thing we wanted to touch on is our end of life support for Decisions version six. Uh, so we have some updated information here I'm showing on the slide uh, where we're going to officially stop supporting version six. Um, so we have a couple dates here, like uh, December 2022, we officially uh, announced our enforcement of the end of life for version six. Um, end of general support uh, on March 1st, 2023. So that includes stuff like support team access, uh, hot fixes, patches, and service packs. Um, and then a total complete end of life support, including critical services starts June 1st, 2023. Uh, and we do this because we wanna make sure that everybody's on the best version of decisions that we can get. We wanna make sure that you have all the best features that we have as well as all the security fixes. Um, so we wanna ensure that you guys have the power to use the best version of decisions that you can use. Um, we can kind of kick on here. And then one other thing is our um, next product roadmap uh, session. So our product team, uh, every other Thursday, will host uh, kind of a little biweekly um, meeting where they ask for feedback and they kind of go over some things that are going to be included in future versions of decisions. Um, and they ask for your feedback there. So we, we want to encourage you, if you want to contribute and you want to be a part of uh, the future of decisions, we absolutely encourage you to join. And we have a registration page. So uh, if you're interested in joining one of those meetings, uh, we can absolutely provide that for you. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to get started. So if anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll be happy to take a stab at it. All right, it looks like Radley was first. So go ahead and... Hey, hey there, Ethan. All right. Hey, Radley. How are you? All right, man. How are you today? Doing okay. What can Very I help good. you with? Very good. I have a, actually two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, so is there a way to run a report to see who has um, impersonation privileges on which other accounts? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my local here. So I would assume... Looking at the account object, that would be our best bet. And I'm thinking something along like a flow source report. So if we look at the account object here, I'm not sure if we have any way to store. Okay, so we have allowed impersonations right here. So let's say if I create a flow. So I'm going to drag out a fetch entity stuff and I'm going to fetch all accounts and I'm going to see if I actually get any data in terms of impersonation. Fetch all accounts. Let's go ahead and run that. Some results. Let's see. Permitted user identifier. 
doesn't look like we fetch any impersonation data. So that may be something that we could potentially look into putting into, I would say something like a feature request. Okay. Because I think there are a couple aspects of the accounts. Uh, I know in the past, just working some different support tickets that they're part of the account when you look at them in the settings, but then they aren't actually a part of that account object. I'm just gonna... Yeah, so it doesn't look like just on my search here that we're fetching any data in terms of impersonation. So I don't think there's a way that we could really filter that out reliably. Okay. Let me write that down quickly too. The situation is I have a person who was a who was an admin, but they've taken a different position in the company and they're no longer an admin, but I know they have impersonation rights and I wanna I wanna pull those back. Yeah, so let's see. I believe if we have administrator permission, we could do something like this, where if we go into the accounts and you can check these accounts here and it'll tell you like allowed impersonations. Um, but obviously, like if we're if we're looking through a whole bunch of different accounts, I can definitely yeah. understand that. Yeah, that that could be <laughs> roughly a little thousand. tedious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I can uh, definitely look in that into that to you, uh, and if you want, I can set up a support ticket, or I can just reach out to you uh, at a later date. Yeah, either one of those would be awesome. Ethan. I appreciate okay. that. Um, completely different question. So I have um, many workflows um, that utilize um, flow execution extensions, and mm -hmm. in what we were given as best practices for those is to um, set up the process folder very early on in the workflow, if not. The, the first um, object in the flow. Um, but what I have happening now is as users either are just seeing what these different flows are or seeing what questions are, are, are asked in those flows, right? They're, they're starting a workflow which is generating um, uh, an, an, open, an open flow that then they're never utilizing again, right? So they have, there's just this flow out there that's been started, it's never gonna be completed. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been assigned a, a number. Um, so I just wanted to talk through, is that the best case to have that process folder created first thing as soon as somebody starts a workflow or is there a way to do that after they've submitted a form with data and ensure that that data gets captured? Or is we, there a better way to clean this up? Maybe, maybe that's a question as well. Yeah, I'm, I might need a better visual just of like what you're okay. looking at. I know we, if you'd like, um, I think there's a way you can share your screen. I'm not super experienced with webinars. Let's see. Um, is there something that you'd like to share though? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'll go ahead and stop my share. Let's see. And Bradley, the only way to share your screen. Yep. Okay. You just have to join as a panelist. So Ethan, he should be able to shortly. All right, perfect. Okay. Share this here. Okay, you see my screen okay? Yep, we're looking at the furlough request flow. Correct. All right, so um, I do some just kind of initial setup here at the beginning, and then I have my, my setup process folder here. Right, so okay. right, I'm, I'm generating this um, uh, furlough request, right, I assign a number to it, and now it's a um, and now it's a folder created uh, in this project. So what's happening is um, through the workflow catalog, uh, people are clicking on you know, create new furlough request. Mm -hmm. It sets up the folder and then they get to uh, the initiator form here. And whatever the, for whatever the reason for clicking uh, to start the new workflow, um, they're just abandoning the workflow at that point, right? They maybe just wanted to see what it was. They didn't, they didn't realize that that's what it was or they wanted to see what fields were asked. So they know what information to gather, whatever. But now it's just an, kind of an abandoned orphaned workflow. Um, and I probably have across all my workflows, I don't know, 75, 100 of these things that are days, weeks, months old. Like people are never coming back to, to restart these workflows again. Okay, yeah, I, 
I kind of see what you're getting at. Typically, I know, especially like when I went through training, like that, that was something that they kind of pushed to me too, is you always want to set up that process folder uh, right at the beginning. Yep. And then you can always come back and edit it at a later date. Um, I don't think realistically that it's something that has to be done that way. I think it was more of, you know, we want to make sure that we're setting everything up early so we can, like I said, come back to it um, as needed. Um, but I think in a situation like you're in right now, I think that is something that we could um, kind of push to after the initial form, uh, just so we have that initial data. And then we, if we don't actually get any data from it, then we aren't creating a process folder that sits idle like you've been experiencing. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that pushing it to a point behind that form is going to necessarily break anything. Obviously, it's something that we could always test and kind of figure out, but um, there's no like law that says it, it has to be at the beginning okay. of the flow or else, you know, it's everything's going to blow up. So there's no risk of, of data loss having it. No, I wouldn't say okay. so. Okay. okay. Like as long as we're passing that data into the process folder when we create it, then, you know, we're, we shouldn't lose anything. Awesome. Cool. Uh, those are my two questions. If you can get back to me on that impersonation thing, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I'll more than likely uh, create a support ticket for okay. you. And then I'll just, I'll just assign it to myself just to make sure that I can absolutely follow up on it. I don't want to awesome. risk. Yeah. I'll send an email and then the yeah. email doesn't happen. That sounds great. Ethan. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. All righty. So it looks like Muriel is up next. Go ahead and my questions actually are about the slides that you showed a little earlier. Yeah, for sure. So um, we are in the process of working on an upgrade from version six to version eight. Mm -hmm. And we are in a um, highly regulated environment with lots of approvals and things. So we won't mm -hmm. be getting that upgrade until possibly May or June. So if I need, and we're going to need someone to hold our hand through the upgrade, um, just from the nightmare we have in person six. Is it just that I would need to open a ticket before March 1st, or can I still contact someone between March and June, say I need help with this, actually with the upgrade? Uh, you can always submit a ticket for it. Like we, we always, as a support team, we're pretty experienced with doing a ton of different upgrade calls. Like that's a pretty regular thing for us to hop on a call and, you know, just even if it's just us being available for the call and we don't actually mm -hmm. do anything. Um, one thing I would recommend though, is I'm not sure who your customer success manager is off the top of my head, but we I mean, encourage. Well. She's, in, she's involved in this process. Okay, perfect. I was going to yeah. say, as long as we're keeping an open line of communication with her, you know, we can always sort of make stuff work. Um, okay. So if it, if it needs to be that like, Hey, we have to do something after hours, like we can make sure that we have somebody available after hours, or if we have like a set day that we can do, um, you know, we're, we're flexible with it in terms of being able to make sure, because we want you to get to version eight. Like we don't want to actively discourage you and say like, oh, well, as soon as this date hits, we're just going to forget that you exist sort of stuff. Like we absolutely want to give you every um, resource available uh, to ensure that you can have a smooth transition from version six to version eight. Perfect. All right. That's one. And the second one, you may not know, but maybe you can tell me who does know. Um, for the roadmap calls, I believe mm -hmm. I've signed up for that twice, and I don't have an invitation for it. So I can double check on that. Um, okay. Sabrina, I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head how those work. I don't have a ton of experience with overseeing those. Um, I do know some people on the roadmap uh, team. So at the very least, I can get in contact with them. Uh, and just see if I can get an invite for you and I can send that over to you. That would be great. I don't know. I mean, usually when I hit registration and I hit, you know, send, enter, whatever, it comes right away and it did not. So. Yeah, it looks like, okay. Sabrina said she'll reach out to uh, Eric. He's the leader of our product team and we'll make sure we get you added. Perfect. Okay, that's what I needed. Thank you. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining. Okay. There's a table allowed account impersonations that we can report on. Interesting. 
So let me double check on that while we're still here. Um, and if, if anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, or if you want, just go ahead and raise your hand. Let me jump in here. I'm going to look into... Well, account impersonations. Interesting. Okay, so we have an account ID right here. So that is something that I can write down as well. Learn something new every day about decisions. All right, so let's see. Doesn't look like we have any other questions active at the moment. Look through here. So let's say we have testeddecisions.com. Edit account. Well, impersonations. Um, so impersonation never expire. Okay, so we've added that. Keep that tab there. Never actually use this table, so I'm kind of exploring my curiosity here. So like for allowed account impersonations. Okay, interesting. This should be this ID. Okay, so account ID is testeddecisions.com. You allow this ID. Okay, impersonation from account administrator account. So that'll be our ID. Okay, so it looks like, yeah, it looks like Radley has dropped off, but that table is definitely something we could use. So just to kind of clear that, um, whoops, just hit the wrong button there. Just to kind of clear that question up uh, overall, it looks like we have that table, the uh, allowed account impersonation and table. So what we could do is we could create a sort of report uh, that would fetch that information uh, so let's see if I can create a project here quickly. And we could go ahead. And since we have a direct table, we can go ahead. Um, let's see. So what we could likely do is have a flow source report. So we can fetch all that information, pass it into this report. So let's see. And we could pass it in. Here. 
reports. Do let's create this. Create an account impersonation report flow. We'll go ahead and change this flow behavior type. Looking for report data source. And we can do a fetch here. So let's see. Mission terms of service. Kind of catching up on our docs here. All right, so I may need a little bit of time to look into this. I definitely think it's possible, but I might have to troubleshoot that a bit because it looks like we're going to have to get this table into a report. Um, I can definitely reach out to Bradley on that. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I guess I'll do one last call just to make sure we don't have any other questions before we can go ahead and wrap this up for the day. All right, looks like David's raised his hand. David, if you want to go ahead and come off mute. Yeah, just a quick question, I guess. Um, yeah, how big, sure. How big of a how big of a lift is it going from six to eight? Uh, there are some framework changes uh, that we have. I think overall that is one of the bigger jumps that we have. Um, but overall, especially after eight has had um, a ton of new releases as well, like it's started to go pretty smoothly. So I, like I said, I, I don't want to discourage you from upgrading at all. Um, we do have some docs as well uh, that I can jump in here. I think we have one dedicated, yeah, upgrading from decisions V6 to V8. And so this kind of goes over the entire process from start to finish um, and it'll walk you through it. Uh, and as I said before, you know, if you ever have any questions at all, you're more than welcome to contact your customer success manager or submit a support ticket. Um, you can reach us support at decisions.com. Um, and we'll be absolutely happy to hop on a call with you, or we can just answer some questions or just be available if that's something that you'd like. Uh, so I'll go ahead and grab this link as well. Post this in the chat here. Uh, but does that answer your question overall? Yeah, I think so. We'll probably just have to look through this and see what, what it would take. Okay, perfect. Then I think, uh, I mean, it's not like this wouldn't be just upgrading our environments. Like we have this deployed to clients too. So I get, we'd have to develop a process for upgrading them or and all that jazz, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. But like I said, our customer success managers are typically the first line in terms of, you know, developing a plan that's uh, kind of specific to your use case. Gotcha. Um, so we can we can absolutely help you through that, whatever questions you have. Okay. Sweet. All right. So I'm not seeing any other questions here. So I think we are good to go ahead and drop. I want to thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, thank you guys for joining the Lunch and Learn. 
Uh, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, absolutely. Take care, everyone.